Journal 2, Dendron. Uncle Press is going to die tomorrow. So much has happened since I wrote to you last, Mark. It's been strange, scary, and confusing, and sometimes even sort of, dare I say it, fun? But the bottom line is, Uncle Press is going to die tomorrow. Right now, I'm sitting in a small cavern that must be 200 feet underground. I'm writing this by the light of a candle, because there is no electricity. I'm looking around, and all I see are rocks, tons and tons of black rocks, that look as if they might collapse on my head at any second. I better stop thinking about it because I'm freaking myself out. The cavern isn't going to collapse. I'm safe here, at least for now. The guy who is in trouble is Uncle Press. I'm telling you this because I need your help. I'm going to ask you to do something for me that is pretty dangerous. Under normal circumstances, I'd never ask you to do something like this. But it's the only thing I can think of that might help me save Uncle Press. I'd understand if you didn't want me want to do it. But before you decide, I want to tell you all that's happened since the last time I wrote to you. Once you know everything, then you can decide. I ended my last letter right after Uncle Press was dragged off by Kagan's knights, and I blacked out. Have you ever blacked out or fainted? It's not like falling asleep at all. When you fall asleep, you never know the exact moment it might happen. You just kind of lie there, waiting, and the next thing you know, bang, it's morning. But when you pass out, you can feel yourself slipping away. It's not a good feeling. Waking up afterward isn't much better. It's a moment where you're not really sure where you are and what's going on. Then suddenly everything rushes into focus, and you're snapped back to reality. It's a pretty rude experience. Of course, in this case... Even after I snapped back to reality, I still didn't know where I was and what was going on. The first thing I saw was a face. A girl's face. For a second, I thought it was Courtney. But once my brain started to click, I realized this girl didn't look anything like Courtney. She was totally beautiful. Whoa, that sounds bad. But that Courtney... Not that Courtney isn't totally beautiful, but this girl was, well, different. I'd say she was my age, maybe a little older. She had dark skin and eyes that were so brown they looked black. Her hair was dark too. It was tied in a long, tight braid that reached halfway down her back. She wore the same kind of weird leather skins that Uncle Press had made me put on. But on her, they looked pretty good because she had an amazing body. She had to be an athlete or something. Seriously, this girl was cut like an Olympic sprinter. No fat, all muscle, totally awesome. And she was tall, maybe a few inches taller than me. If I saw her at home, I'd guess she was of African descent. But this wasn't home. I lay flat on my back as she looked down at me with absolutely no expression. I couldn't tell if she was glad I was alive, or getting to finish the job the quig started and kill me once and for all. We stayed that way for a few seconds, with neither of us moving. Finally, I swallowed to make sure my voice would work and croaked out, where am I? No points for originality, but hey, I wanted to know. The girl didn't answer. She stood up and walked to a table that had a couple of wooden bowls. She picked one up and held it out for me, but I didn't take it. Who knows what she was trying to give me? It could have been poison. It could have been blood. It could have been some vile-tasting liquid that they considered a delicacy here, but would make me puke. It is water, she said flatly. Oh, I took it. I was thirsty. The girl then walked over to the door and stood with her arms folded. I took a drink and looked around to get my bearings. I was inside what looked like some kind of hut. It wasn't big, maybe the size of my living room at home. There was only one room with six six walls. It was a hexagon. The walls were built of stones that were held together by dried mud. There were a few holes which passed for windows and one big opening for a door. The ceiling rose to a center point and was made of interwoven tree branches. 
The floor was dirt, but it was so hard it might as well have been made concrete. I was lying on a low bench thingy that was made out of lashing together logs. The top was woven out of straw or something. It was comfortable enough, but I wouldn't want to sleep a whole night here. There was a bunch more of these beds lined up in the hut, which made me think this might be some kind of hospital. It made sense. After what I'd been through, I belonged in a hospital. It was like I had stepped into a time machine and been sent back a few thousand years to an age when people built their world out of anything they could get their hands on and didn't care for personal hygiene. Oh, yes, did I mention the place smelled like a locker room for goats? It made me wonder if the mortar holding together the stone walls was really mud or something disgusting that would make me wretch if I knew what it was. I looked over to this amazing girl. She stood there, standing back, staring back. Was she a friend? An enemy? A guard who was standing watch until one of those night guys came in to drag me off like they did to Uncle Press? A million thoughts ran through my head, but one thought stood out above all others. I had to pee. The last time I took a leak was before Courtney showed up at my house. When was that? A million years ago? Judging by how my bladder felt, it was at least that long. So rather than lie there and wet my leather pants, I started to get up. Hey, I said. I gotta... As soon as I moved, the girl flew into attack mode. She instantly crouched down and whipped out a wooden pole that must have been strapped to her back. It was about five feet long and well worn from use. She held the weapon steady with both hands, and I saw that each end was stained shiny black from hitting things I didn't even want to imagine. Scarier still were her eyes. They were dead set focused on her target, which happened to be me. I froze. No way I was going to stand up or she would have whacked me so fast my head would have hit the ground before my feet did. I didn't want to move at all for fear of setting her off. We both stayed that way waiting for the other one to make the next move. One thing I knew for sure, it wasn't going to be me and if she took a step toward me, I'd be off that bench and out the window head first. Then a voice called out from outside. Buzz up Saga. At least that was it sound like. I'm not exactly sure of the spelling. Someone stepped in through the door. It was a wo woman dressed in the same crusty leather clothes that apparently were fashionable in this neighborhood. She actually looked like an older version of the girl who was about to brain me. But as powerful as this woman looked, there was something about her that made me feel as if she could possibly be my savior. I think it was her eyes. They were kind eyes, no anger there at all. Where she looked at me, I knew it was going to be okay. She looked familiar, though I can't imagine where I could have met her before. She gave the younger girl a stern look, and the girl reluctantly responded by putting her weapons away. Whoa, disaster averted. The woman then turned to me and said, Forgive my daughter. She often takes herself too seriously. New info. This was a mother-daughter team. I guess I shouldn't have been surprised. They looked alike. I wondered what Dad looked like. He must have been a linebacker. I still didn't feel comfortable moving. This woman seemed cool, but after what I have been through, I wasn't taking any chances. She walked to me, knelt down by the bench, and gave me a kind smile. My name is Osa, she said softly. My daughter name is Lure. Uh, I'm Bobby, and I'm not from here, was I could think of. With a smile, Osa said, Neither are we, and we know exactly who you are, Pendragon. We've been waiting for you. Whoa, she knew who I was. A million thoughts flashed through my brain, but one in particular jumped out. If they knew who I was, then why was Amazon girl over there ready to beat my brains out? I figured I better not ask. I didn't want to tick Lure off. She might decide to yank out her stick and start wailing on me anyway. How do you know me? I asked. From Press, of course, she answered. He has been telling us about you for quite some time. That's right. 
Now I remember where I'd seen her before. Uncle Press had brought her to our house. We had met before. I remember thinking how beautiful she was and how odd it was that she didn't speak. The mystery was over. She was a friend of Uncle Press. But that realization was quickly replaced with another. Man, I'd almost forgotten Uncle Press was in trouble. At least I think he was in trouble. Those night boys who lassoed him and pulled him off didn't exactly look like his pals. A rush, a rush of adrenaline shot through my body, and I sat up fast. He's in trouble, I shouted. Bad move. Not the shouting part, the sitting up fast part. My body was one big black and blue mark from our bobsled crash in the forest. A wave of pain hit me like, like, well, like a, like that stick would have hit me if Lou was taking batting practice at me. I don't know why I didn't realize it before, but I was really hurt. It felt like every one of my, of my ribs was cracked. The pain was so intense, it took my breath away. My legs went weak, and I had to lie back down, or I would have passed out again. Osa quickly grabbed my shoulders and gently lowered me back on the bench. It's all right, she said with a soothing voice. The pain will not last. How could she know that? Unless maybe she thought I was about to die. Nothing short of death was going to stop this burning pain anytime soon. But what happened next was nothing short of amazing. I lay there taking short, quick breaths because deep breaths made the pain even worse. Osa then reached out and gently put her hand on my chest. She looked into my eyes and I swear, Mark, it was like I melted. The tension totally flew out of me. Relax, she said softly. Breathe slowly. I did. Soon my heart stopped pounding, and I could take a deep breath. But most amazing of all, the pain went away. I swear, the second before I, I was hurting so bad I couldn't even, cr couldn't even cry. Now it was gone. Completely. Osa, Osa took her hand away and glanced over to Lure for a reaction. Lure turned away. She wasn't impressed. But I sure was. It was some kind of miracle. How did you do that? I asked while sitting up and feeling my ribs. Do what? Was Osa's innocent reply. You are, are you kidding me? I shouted. My ribs. I was di like dying. You touched me and poof. I'm off injured reserve. Osa stood up and said, Perhaps you were not hurt as badly as you thought. Yeah, right, I shot back. I know what pain is, especially when it's mine. That's when Lure decided to join the party. We are wasting time, she said in a peeved voice. Press is being held by Kagan. I didn't care much for Lure's style, but she was right. Who is this Kagan dude? I asked. There are many things you must learn, said Osa. Press was to begin teaching you, but until he returns, the task will be mine. Come. She walked over to the hole in the wall that was a door and stood next to her daughter. They both looked at me, which I took as my clue to follow. I stood up, ready to feel the pain, and my, my ribs shot back. I didn't. Amazing. I then looked at Lure to see if she would spring into attack mode again. She didn't. So far, so good. Shouldn't we find Uncle Press? I asked. We will, responded Osa. But first you must learn about Dendron. Dendron, right. That's where I was. There wasn't much I liked about Dendron so far, and I couldn't imagine finding out anything else that would make me like it anymore. But I didn't have a whole lot of options. So I followed the others toward the door. I took two steps and then stopped, remembering something very, very important. Uh, where do I go to, uh, you know, I've got to... Relieve yourself there, Lur said coldly, pointing to a far corner of the room, where there was a wooden screen separating a small space from the rest of the hut. Great, thanks, I replied and hurried toward it. When I looked behind the screen, I learned two things. One was that these people didn't have indoor plumbing. The toilet was nothing more than a hole in the ground, Surrounded by a circle of stones. Not exactly com comfy. The second thing was that the mystery of why this place smelled so bad was solved. I guess these people hadn't figured out 
that an outhouse should definitely be out of the house. Man, it smelled like a sick elephant had been using this thing. But what the heck, it wasn't my house and I had to go to bed. So I held my breath against the stink and then took about five minutes to figure out how to undo the leather cords. I guess these people hadn't yet discovered zippers either. It was during this that I realized the furs I had been wearing were gone. I guess somebody took them while I was unconscious. That was fine by me because if I'd had to go through another layer, I would have wet myself for sure. After I finished, I hurried across the stone hut to catch up. I didn't know what I was expecting to find outside, so I guess no matter what I saw, it would have been a surprise. But when I stepped outside, I had to stop and catch my breath because I had just stepped into another world. And it was like nothing I had ever seen before. The hut I had just come, came from was in the middle of the village of stone huts. They all looked the same, more or less with stone walls and roofs made of woven branches and straw. There was no decorations of any kind to distinguish one from the next. Some had smoke curling up from the stone chimney, which meant that there were fires burning inside it for cooking and for heat. The roads and pathways that snaked between the huts were dirt, well-worn and narrow. And why not? It's not like they had to worry about cars or anything. All the huts were built around a big grassy area kind of like a town square, with a large round platform about 10 feet across at its center. The base of the platform was made of stones, like the huts, and it was topped by a surface made of lashed together logs. The setup reminded me of those towns that have a gazebo in the center of a park for concerts and stuff, but the stage was empty now, no shows today. The village was busy with people doing whatever people do in a village like this. They were hurrying here and there, and some carrying baskets of food, others moving a herd of goats. They all wore the same kind of leather clothes I was wearing. So even though I felt out of place, I probably didn't look it. The people who looked out of place were Osa and Lur. As I described them to you, they were both tall, dark-skinned, and athletic-looking. They were no other people of color in this village, just the opposite. The people of Dendron were the palest people I had ever seen in my life. It was like they never saw a day of sun in their lives. That was strange, because even though it happened to be overcast just then, I had seen three suns in the sky from on top of the mountain. Could it be that the suns here didn't give you a tan? Or was it mostly always overcast? Like Seattle or something. Whatever the reason, it was pretty obvious that Osa and Lur were not from Dendron, just as they had said. The village had been cut out of a forest. Looking one way beyond the huts was vast farmland. I could see many people working out there, tending the, to the crops. Looking off in the opposite direction, I saw the mountain where Uncle Press and I had made our idiot bobsled run to escape the quigs. Other, and the other direction showed nothing but forest. Not that I'm an expert anthropologist or anything, but this first brief look at the village made me think of books and movies I'd seen from Europe. Back in Middle e Evil days, the only thing missing was some huge castle that loomed over the village. Osa and Lur let me stand there for a few minutes so I could take in the surroundings. I was about to join them when suddenly I was grabbed from behind and spun around. Oga to Van Bursa! It was a little guy with long scraggly hair, an eye patch over one eye, and a smile that showed more spaces than teeth. On each of his fingers was a different ring that looked to be braided out of rope. Ten fingers, ten rings. The guy was grum grubby, but he sure liked jewelry. I had no idea what he wanted until he shoved a furry looking thing at me. I jumped back, but then realized it was some kind of wooly shirt, like a sweater. Ogatavan, he said again with a smile as he shoved a piece of clothing at me. I figured he was harmless and that he wanted me to take the thing. 
hey, what the heck? Maybe it was a local welcome custom. It was kind of chilly, and this leather shirt thing I was wearing wasn't keeping me all that warm. So I smiled back at him and reached for it. But just as I was about to take it, the little guy pulled it back, held out his hand, and rubbed his fingers together. Yes, he was giving me the international sign. No, I guess it was more the intergalactic sign for you want it, you pay for it. This weird little guy was trying to strike a deal for the sweater. Figgies, leave him be, said O as she stepped between us. Bob Abba Khan Forbai, said the little guy innocently. But at least I think it was innocently. His language made no sense to me. Osa looked at Figgis and said, He has only just arrived. Go sell your wares somewhere else. The guy was a salesman. He seemed to deflate in disappointment and started to walk away. But then he turned back and gave me a sm sly, toothless smile. From out, his, out of his grunty shirt, he held up a shiny red apple, trying to tempt me. It looked good. Go! commanded Osa. Figgis snarled at her and ran away. Figgis would sell you his breath if he could, she explained. They say he wears a patch because he sold his eye to a blind man. Nice. That was fairly disgusting image. Osa, I asked, are you from Earth? Osa laughed and looked to Lure to share the joke that I didn't get. Lure didn't laugh back. Big surprise. Why do you think that? She asked. You know English, I said. You are wrong, Pendragon, she said. I do not understand a word of English. Come. She left me there and continued walking with Lure. Huh? I could be mistaken, but I thought, sh I thought sure we were speaking English. I should know. Aside from a little classroom Spanish, it's the only language I know. This was getting frustrating. Every time I thought I was starting to get a handle of things, something would come along and pull the rug out from under, under me. I figured I'd better get used to it. Osa and Lure were already way ahead of me, so I had to run to catch up. I had to jog to keep pace with their long strides, while making sure to keep Osa between me and Lure. I liked the mom, but I didn't trust the daughter. I kept catching her throwing me these looks. You aren't worthy, worthy to breathe air that could go to someone more deserving. Looks. She was giving off a major cold vibe. I figured it would be best to stay out of her way. I don't understand, I said to Osa. How can you say you don't know English if you are speaking it? I am not speaking English, See it, she answered. You are speaking English. I am speaking the language from Zada, which is our home territory. Sounds like English to me, I said. Of course it does. That is because you are a traveler. This was getting more confusing by the second. So you're saying that travelers understand all languages? Logical question, right? No, came the illogical reply. Travelers hear all languages as their own. And when they speak... Others will understand them no matter what their native language. Cool. If this were true, maybe I'd have a shot at getting better than my usual lousy C in Spanish class. Still, something didn't fit. Okay, so how come when that Figgis guy spoke, it sounded like blah 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 to me? Suddenly, Lure jumped in front of me. I had to put on the brakes or walk into her. That would have hurt. Because maybe you are not a traveler, she said while challenging. She said with a challenging snarl. Ah, suddenly all came clear. Lure didn't think I was who I was. That's why she was acting all strange and aggressive. Of course. I wasn't even sure myself who I was supposed to be. So there wasn't anything I could say to convince her that I was me. Or I was who I was. Or you get the idea. Again, Osa came to my rescue saying, The reason you did not understand Figgis is that you have not learned to hear. You understand us because we are travelers. 
but Figis is not. You must learn to hear without trying to listen. Say what? Hear without he listening? That sounds like for fortune cookie or logic. How can he be a traveler? He is just a boy, Lure said to her mother vehemently. He is soft and frightened. He will do more harm than good. Whoa. How is that for an ego pounding? Ouch. Unfortunately, though, she was right. I was soft and frightened. Maybe I wasn't a traveler after all. Fla frankly, it wouldn't kill me to find out I wasn't. No matter how much it would have helped. My Spanish still grades. I was beginning to think that maybe this was all some sort of big mistake that they would send me home. Osa looked at me with those dark knowing eyes, but spoke to Lure saying, No, Pendragon is traveler, but he has much to learn. Then she looked at her daughter and said, And you seem to forget that you are but a child yourself. Lure stormed off in a huff. I got the feeling she didn't like being told she was wrong. Osa turned to me and said, You will find that she is not always so angry. Hey, no big deal, I shot back. Just so long as she isn't angry at me. Osa smiled and walked on. I followed, and she began to tell me about Dendron. The people who live in this village are a tribe called the Milago, she began. As you can see, they live a simple life. They grow all of their own food and live peacefully with the other tribes of Dendron. Milago. Uncle Press had used that word just before those knights showed up. He said they'd find me, so I guess they are the good guys. What are those knight-looking guys who attacked Uncle Press? I asked. Are they Milago too? No, answered Osa. That is what I want to show you. We continued walking out of the village and along a path in the woods for about a quarter of a mile. I judge all distances by the track at Stony Brook High. It's a quarter of a mile around, and it felt like I walked about the di that distance of a mile track. We broke out of the woods into a clearing, and I was yet again hit with an amazing sight. Remember how I asked the old only thing missing from the middle evil village was a big old castle looming over it? Well, as it turns out, there was a big old castle. It just wasn't doing any looming. Here's what I saw. When we emerged from the path through the trees, we came upon a huge open field of grass. We walked across this rolling field until we came to a cliff on the far side. Down below the cliff was water. Yes, we were at the edge of an ocean as vast and as blue as the Atlantic. The sea was to my right, and I turned to look down the coast, an uneven craggy shoreline with big rocky cliffs. I saw that the cliffs were on was actually one side of an inlet. Looking down over the edge, I saw wave after wave of seawater crashing on the rocks below. Far below. We were so high above the water, I started getting sweaty palms. I'm not going I'm not good with heights. I looked up straight and straight ahead to the cliff on the far side of the inlet to see that the land on top was covered with more l lush seagrass that waved in the ocean breeze. Then what I saw below that grass took my breath away. Built right into the face of the cliff was a monster fortress. It looked as if it were literally carved out of rock that made up the bluff. I could see several levels of stone balconies where knights like the ones who attacked Uncle Press were keeping guard. They marched back and forth with lethal-looking spears over their shoulders. I'm not exactly sure what they were guarding against. Marading fish, I suppose? I counted five levels of balconies, so this fortress was big. Osa must have read my mind because she said, You are only seeing the outside wall of the palace. It is built far into the cliff. It is a village in itself. From what I saw so far, these people didn't have any heavy-duty construction equipment, so this place was chiseled out of the rock by hand. 
It must have taken centuries to dig such a huge building out of hard rock using simple tools. There has always been two tribes here, she continued. The Milago work the land. The Bedouin are the soldiers and rulers. At one time, many of the tribes of Dendron were at war. The Bedouin protected the Milago from raiders, and in the return, the Milago provided food. Each tribe relied upon the other, while they remained mu very much apart. It lasted that way for centuries, with both tribes living in relative harmony. But the Bedouin were powerful, and power can lead to arrogance. It was forbidden for the Milago to marry a Bedouin, or even to become friends. As so often happens in situations like this, the Bedouin began to look upon the Milago as their slaves. But still they protect the Milago, right? I asked. There have been no invaders here for many years. Their need for protection no longer exists, said Milago, said Osa. So the Milago guys just do all the work and the Bedouin guys do what? That is a good question. The Bedouin are ruled by the royal family. With the role of monarch passed down to the eldest child, there was a time not too long ago that the Bedouin monarch wanted to break down the barriers between the two tribes and allow them to become one. But he died and left the monarchy to his firstborn. There are some who believe that the father was murdered by those who did not want the Bedouin to give up their superior position. And let me guess, the new monarch likes having slaves, and wants to keep the two tribes apart. Yes, she said. The Milago are, afla are afraid to even say the name K Kagan. There was that name again. I was beginning to get the picture, and I didn't like it. The, the knight who attacked Uncle Press thought he was spying on Kagan. I said, but Uncle Press pretended that he was a miner. Are there mines here? Yes, she said with a sad breath. But that, that is the worst part of the story. Oh great, it gets worse. Just what I wanted to hear. But before Osa could continue, I heard the sound of a far off drum. It was a steady booming sound that came from the direction of the Milago village. Lou ran up to us and said breathlessly, It is a transfer, hurry! She took off running back the way we came. Osa looked at me and said with concern, Stay close to me. Do not let them see you. With that, she took off after Lou. As I told you, these two were the athletes. But I didn't care how fast they were. I was going to keep up with them. I caught up and kept right on Osa's tail as... We beat feet along the path back to the Milago village. Good thing it, it was only about a half mile away, or I would have bonked for sure. As we approached the village, I saw that everyone was gathering toward the central area, with the stage in the middle. I guess there was going to be a show after all. People came in from the fields, emptied, fr emptied from their huts, and generally left whatever they were doing to crowd around the platform. I was all set to join the crowd, when Osa grabbed my hand and pulled me in another direction. The three of us climbed on top of one of the stone huts and positioned ourselves on the roof so we could get a good view of the show. They most might see us, cautioned Osa. We are not part of this. Whatever, no biggie. We had the best view in the house. Anyway, so I settled in and wondered what the performance was going to be. Maybe some Milago musicians or some school play thing. I looked out at the meeting ground and saw the Milago villagers gathered in a wide circle around the central platform, which wasn't empty anymore. On top of it was some kind of contraption that looked like a seesaw. On one end was a seat. On the other was a big, wide mouth basket. Standing on the platform next to the gizmo, was one of Kagan's knights, beating on a drum. I hope the purpose of this guy was to signal for everyone to gather, because if this was the whole show, I wasn't impressed. The deep booming sound echoed across the village. 
This rhythm was pretty lousy too. Standing next to the platform were six more knights. They stood at attention, each holding a nasty looking spear in front of them. The Milago villagers gave these guys a wide berth. I would have too. They didn't look friendly. It started to dawn on me that none of these people looked as if they were getting ready for a good time. There wasn't an excited air of anticipation that comes before a fun event. No, once, no one spoke or laughed or joked, except for the booming drum. It was deathly quiet. These people all had a look of dread on their faces. Osa then tapped me on the shoulder and pointed to the far side of the clearing. I looked to see a group of four Milago villagers walking slowly toward the assembly. They were all men who were covered with dirt from head to toe. Not that any of these Milago people were all that clean to begin with, but these guys were pretty gnarly. The black dirt really stood out boldly against their pasty white skin. The four men were carrying a large basket filled with craggy rocks of all sizes. Some were as large as bowling balls, others were much smaller, but the thing that really stood out about them was that they were blue, and I mean bright blue, like dazzling sapphires. I had never seen anything so stunning. The stones are called, called glaze, whispered Osa. They are mines throughout this area. The Milago mine for glaze all day and night. I guess it's valuable, I stated, stating the obvious. Very, she said. Glaze is the foremost reason why Kagan wants to keep control over the Milago. Glaze has made the Bedouin wealthy. They trade with merchants from all over Dendron. So long as the Milago mine for gla Glaze, Kagan remains a powerful monarch. So Kagan and the Bedouin weren't only lazy bullies, they were greedy bullies who forced the Milago to do their dirty work. Nice guys. I wanted to ask more questions, but suddenly the drummer stopped pounding, and an ominous silence fell over the village. The four miners brought the basket of glaze to the platform and carefully placed it down. The whole thing was starting to take on the air of a ceremony. The transfer is what Lure called it. That's when I heard the sound of a galloping horse. Someone was coming straight down the path where we had walked out to the ocean, and he was coming fast. The weird thing was, nobody turned to look. Nobody but me, that is. As the horse came charging out of the forest, I saw that rider... I saw that riding was a guy who looked like he knew what he was doing. He was a big guy, with long dark hair, wearing some kind of leather armor, similar to what the knights had on. But his armor didn't look like it had many battles. It was clean and unscarred, unlike the knight's armor, which looked pretty beaten up. As he galloped, galloped up to the circle of villagers, they parted to give him access to the platform. Good thing, too, because he didn't slow down. I think if the people hadn't moved, he would have plowed over them. Already, I did not like this guy. Is this Kagan? I whispered. Osa and Lur exchanged secret looks, Th like they were something going on that they didn't want to tell me about. I caught the look and I didn't like it. His name is Malos, answered Mo Osa. He is Kagan's chief advisor. Malos, Kagan, Osa, Lur, Philip, Figus. Was I the only guy around here who had a first and last name? This Malos guy rode his horse right up to the platform and stopped. My guess was, the show was about to begin. He sat there on his horse and surveyed the assembly crowd, like he owned them. None of the Milago looked his look, like returned his look. They all stood there with their heads down, avoiding his gaze. It didn't take a genius to figure out that they were afraid of him. Malos then turned in his saddle, saddle and looked right up to where we were hiding on the roof. Stay down, ordered Lure with a strong whisper. We all ducked down farther, trying to press ourselves into the roof to make ourselves smaller. But I I could still see Mallows. As his horse licked at the dirt, he sat there stock still, 
looking toward us. It was like he knew we were there. But that was impossible. There was no way he could have seen us. That's when it happened. As I looked back at him, I was hit with a realization so shocking that it made me gasp in surprise. I think the thing that tipped it off were his eyes. As far away as he was, I knew those cold blue eyes. How could I forget? Osa and Lure both sensed my surprise and looked at me questioningly. Saint Dane, I said softly. You know him? whispered Lure with a total shock. Yeah, he tried to kill me back on Earth, just before I got flumed here, I said. I couldn't believe those words had just come out of my mouth. There was a lot going on in that one little sentence. It would have sounded like fantasy about 24 hours ago, but right now, it made all too much sense. Osa and Lur exchanged concerned looks again. Then Lur whispered to me, he followed you to second earth. She said, as if it were an amazing thing to have happened. I shrugged and nodded a slight yes. It was the first time she looked at me with something other than total disdain. Up until now, she acted as if I were less important than the dirty dirt on her boots. But now her look was one of, well, curiosity. Maybe the fact that I survived the encounter with St. Dane proved that I wasn't so soft after all. Of course, I wasn't about to tell her that all I did was run for my life. I wasn't an idiot. Looking down at St. Dane or Malos, or whatever he called himself, I got hit with a strong wave of, I want to go home. But that wasn't going to happen anytime soon. I was stuck here, looking at a guy who had tried to kill me. Could he see me? Was he going to kick that horse into gear and come charging toward the hut? Would be trapped up here on the roof. All I could do was hold my breath. I felt like a life it felt like a lifetime, but Saint Dane finally turned away. I could breathe again. With a wave of his hand, he said sharply, Begin Whoa, he spoke English. Did that mean he knew English? Or that he too was a traveler, and that's why I could understand him. That question would have to wait. For the main event finally began. One of the miners who had carried in the basket of glaze stepped forward. He was a big guy, and something about the way he carried himself told me that he was in charge. Whatever was about to happen, this guy didn't seem too happy about it. Every move, every move he made was stiff and forced, as if the pressure of doing what he had to do was physically painful. That is Relin whispered Osa. He is the chief miner. Guess I nailed that one. Of course, he was another one, an, another one-named guy. Relin stepped up onto the platform and turned to the crowd. He then held out his hand and gestured to someone. The crowd parted, and a man stepped forward to join him on the platform. He was a tall, skinny guy, which I point out only because of what happened next. The skinny guy walked over to the seesaw thing and sat down on the end with a seat. Since there was no weight on the other side, he tipped his end down to the floor of the platform. Relin gestured to the other miners, and the three guys loaded the basket of glaze onto the platform, placing it near the opposite end of the seesaw. That, what were they going to do? Measure the guy's weight in glaze? They make a transfer every day, explained Osa. Malo is one of the Milago, and that determines how much glaze they must mine for caking the next day. I was right. Measuring the guy's weight in glaze was exactly what they were going to do. The big seesaw was a scale. The miners reached into the basket of glaze, and were about to pick up the first few stones to begin the process when St. Day barked. No! The miner stopped. Everyone held their breath, waiting for St. Dane's next move. St. Dane surveyed the crowd, then pointed. Him, he said with no emotion. There was a general rumbling of discontent within the crowd. Two of the knights pushed roughly past a few of the villagers and grabbed the man St. Dane had pointed to. 
He was a much bigger man than the first guy. The rules had just changed, and Relin didn't like it. Malo's car! He was ticked off and started yelling angrily at St. Dane. I won't write the words as I heard them because, as you know, his language made no sense to me. I'll just tell you the translation that Osa gave me. Malos has chosen a different subject for the transfer, and Relin is a telling him that it is not fair. Osa explained, through it, though I pretty much figured that out on my own. He is pleading with Malos to use the choice he made yesterday. I could see why. This new guy was much happier than the original guy. If they had mined enough of the, the glaze of, to balance with the first guy, there was no way they'd have enough to balance with the second guy. Relin begged St. Dane for the fairness. St. Dane didn't flinch. He looked at Relin like he was a bug. Then one of the knights stepped up to Relin and slaps him on the side of the face with his spear. Relin spun around, and I could see the fiery anger in his eyes. He was already bleeding from the smack on his cheek. I could tell he was a breath away from leaping at the knight's throat, but he didn't. That was a smart, because the other knights had stand, were standing right there, ready with their weapons. He would have been harmed. Look at me, Relin, commanded St. Dane. Relin looked up at his enemy on the horse. Begin a loyal subject. You should want to do more for Kagan than is expected of you, St. Dane said with an arrogance that even made my blood boil. Are you telling me that you are doing the least amount of work that is necessary? Relin answered with a seething yet controlling tirade that Osa translated for me. He is arguing that mining glaze is difficult and dangerous. Every ounce they pull from the mines comes at a huge cost. He says they mine as much as they possibly can, St. Dane snickered and said, We will see. He then gestured to the knights. One of them jumped up onto the platform, grabbed the skinny guy who was sitting on the end of the seesaw, and pushed him off the platform. Then, the other two knights dragged the heavyset guy onto the platform and jammed him down into the seat. This guy was scared. He looked to Relin with pleading eyes, but there was nothing Relin could do. Now, said St. Dane, you may begin. The miners looked to Relin, who gave them a slight nod. They had no choice, so they went to work taking the glaze from the basket and putting the stones on the opposite end of the seesaw. What happens if they don't make the weight? I asked Osa. Let us hope you do not have to find out, came her ominous answer. The miners quickly placed the glazed stones on the scale, starting with the longer, larger ones and working their way down to marble-sized ones. The villagers' eyes were all focused on the scale. My guess is that no one was breathing. I know I wasn't. When the miners were about halfway through, the seesaw began to move, ever so slowly, the heavy man on the opposite end of the scale began to rise. As soon as he felt himself move, a look of relief came over his face. Maybe there would be enough glazed stones to balance him after all. With renewed hope, the miners continued to pile the stones on the scale. Slowly, the scale moved and the heavyset man rose into the air. I could feel the mood of the, mood of the crowd beginning to turn. They were going to do it. They had mined more than enough glaze that day, just as St. Dane had demanded. With the last few small stones, the scale rose until it was perfectly level. It took every last one they had, but they made it. If this had been a World Series game, the crowd would have been had have erupted into a cheer, but this was no game. Even though I could sense their joy and relief, no one made a peep. I saw them secretly exchanging little smiles of joy. There were even a few quick secret hugs. It was a good moment. Even Relin looked relieved, though he tried not to show it. Throwing victory back at, in St. Dane's face would not have been a smart thing to do. St. Dane didn't react. I couldn't tell if he was happy they had mined as so much extra glaze, or ticked that the Milago had met his unfair challenge. 
He swung his leg over and jumped down from his horse. He climbed up onto the platform and looked at the level scale with a slight smile. Suddenly the mood of the crowd grew tense again. What was Saint Dane going to do? He looked to the heavyset man who was swaying on the end of the scale. The man looked down, afraid to make eye contact. Saint Dane then walked to the end of the scale where the glaze stones were piled into the basket. Well done, Relin, he said. You have mined quite a large amount of... He stopped talking and leaned in close to the basket of glazed stones. Throughout the crowd, the people started holding one another's hand for strength. Saint Dane gazed into the basket of stones and said, Relin, I'm surprised at you. There is a stone in here that is not pure glaze. Uh-oh. Relin had made a move to run to the basket, but two of the knights held him back. Relin yelled something at St. Dane, but it didn't matter what he said. St. Dane reached into the basket, grabbed the largest glaze stone, and picked it up instantly. The scale tipped, and the heavyset man slammed down onto the platform, hard. St. Dane carried the stone over to Relin and held it up to his face. You know that Kagan only accepts stone of pure glaze, he said through smug, clenched teeth. Not that I'm a geology expert or anything, but that stone looked like every other stone in the batch. St. Dane was changing the rules again. You know what must happen now, he said with mock sadness. Apparently the heavyset men knew it too. He scrambled to his feet and jumped off down off the platform. He wanted out of there fast, but the knights grabbed him and held him tight. What's happening? I asked Osa. Osa didn't answer. She kept staring at the scene with sad eyes. I figured I was going to find the answer soon anyway, and turned back to watch the last act of this drama. One of the other knights quickly grabbed a heavy chain that was attached to one end of the wooden platform. He pulled on it, and half of the platform top lifted up like a trapdoor. Underneath there looked like nothing. The platform was built over a large hole. It is the first mine shaft that was dug here in the Milago village, Osa said without taking her sad eyes off the scene. It is a pit that reaches down farther than the eye can see. I am afraid... There are many lonely bones resting on the bottom. My mind was racing. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. They were going to toss this guy down the mine shaft. Why don't the Malago do something? I asked. There are hundreds of them. Why don't they stop it? The knights dragged the heavy set man closer to the open pit. Baga baga, va po, va pay, he cried. It was horrible. No one in the crowd moved. No one tried to help the poor guy, even Relin. It was like they knew it was futile. I noticed that next to me, Lou reached to her pack and grabbed hold of the wooden weapon. But Osa put her hand over the, her daughter's. You know it is not the time, she said softly. Lou didn't release her weapon at first. I could feel her tension. One push, and she would be down there, swinging away. But today was not that day. She kept her eyes on the scene and released her grip on the weapon. The knights dragging the screaming heavy man up to St. Dane, who looked at the poor guy without a trace of sympathy, and said, If you were such a gluten, you may have lived to see another day. St. Dane then nodded to at the knights, and they dragged the poor screaming man toward the open pit. Ka ka, he pleaded. Maga con da pe, maga con da da. Moi for light, white, and two children. Please, I must take care of them. They will be all alone. The scene was so horrifying that it wasn't until later that it hit me. I could understand him. It sure sounded like English. But it didn't make sense that he suddenly would have switched language. Osa said that the travelers had the ability to understand all languages. 
And since I was suddenly able to understand this man, maybe I was a traveler after all. But I didn't think about that until later. Right now, I was witnessing the most gut-wrenching moment I could imagine. The two knights dragged the heavy man closer to the open pit. Suddenly, a woman jumped out of the crowd and tried to pull him away from his executioners. She was in tears and begging for mercy. She must have been the man's wife, but her brave effort didn't help. She was quickly grabbed by another knight and thrown to the ground. She lay there in the grass, sobbing. The knights finally got the man to the edge of the pit and were about to push him in when the man suddenly stopped wailing. Up until this point, he had been crying and begging for his life. But now he stopped fighting and stood up straight. I swear, there was a look on his face that was almost calm. The knights didn't know how to react. They weren't used to someone being calm during the worst moment of their life. The heavy man turned and faced St. Dane. And in a dis distinct, strong voice, he said, My only regret is that I will not live long enough to see Kagan suffer the way we have all suffered. St. Dane chuckled and said, None of you will live that long, for that day will never come. He then gave a quick, almost imperceptible nod, and the two knights pushed the doomed man backward into the pit. His wife screamed, but the guy didn't let out a sound. One second he was there, the next he was just gone. Hopefully the, his death would be quick, and he would now be in a better place than this horrible village. The knight holding the chain let it go, and the wooden platform fell down with a boom. St. Dane walked up to Relin, who looked him right in the eye. St. Dane then pointed at the man's sobbing wife. We will use her for tomorrow's transfer, he said with pleasure. She seems quite light. It should make for an easy day. Please thank me for being so considerate. Relin looked at St. Dane, and for a second, I thought he was going to spit in his face, but he didn't. Instead, he gritted his teeth and said, Thank you. You're welcome, St. Dane said with a smile. With that, he strode to his horse, jumped into the saddle, and was just about to ride off when he once again looked back toward us. Actually, it was more like he was looking right at me. I could feel it. He knew I was there. Was all this a show for me? St. Dane laughed and kicked his horse and rode off through the stunned crowd back toward the Bedouin palace. The knights, the knights pushed a few of the miners toward the basket of glaze with their spears. The valuable stones had to be delivered to Kagan, and it was clear that they weren't the ones who was going to carry them. That was a job for their slaves. The miners picked up the basket from the seesaw and started the long walk toward the palace. The rest of the villagers started to disperse. Not a word was spoken. A few people went up to console the poor woman, who had just lost her husband, but most simply headed back toward their homes. They had been through their ho this horror before, and they probably would go through it again. But I had it. I was frantic. I had just witnessed a man murdered in cold blood. It was even more horrible than the poor homeless guy who St. Dane had hypnotized into running into the subway train back in New York. That was awful, but it didn't seem real. This was very, very real, and I didn't understand it. My emotions were all over the place, and yes, I'm not ashamed to admit it, I was crying. There were tears of anger and fear and sadness for a man I didn't even know, and for his family. I didn't care that I was crying in front of Lure or anyone else. I was out of control. Why didn't they do something? I shouted at, Lu at Osa. They could have ganged up on the knights. They could have pulled the guy away. They didn't. They didn't stop it. Osa was as calm as I was upset. She said, if they had done anything, Kagan would have sent an army to punish them. They had no choice. I looked to Lure and was surprised to she see that she too was upset. She may not have been ranting the way I was, but her icy calm was cracked. I even thought I could see a tear in her eye. 
Maybe there was a heart beneath that tough exterior after all. Still, I didn't buy what Osa was saying. So what? They should have done something, I cried. If they don't do something, it'll never stop. Osa put a hand on my shoulder, and I could feel myself starting to calm down. But what she said next was the last thing I wanted to hear. They are going to do something, Pendragon. They are going to take destiny into their own hands and rise up against Kagan. That is why we are here. We are going to help them. You are going to help them. These words hit me like a bolt from the blue. Uncle Press had told me there were people who needed our help. But I had no idea he was talking about an entire village of people who were, were at the mercy of a vicious army that didn't think twice about killing people in cold blood. This was crazy. I felt bad for these people. But there was nothing I could do to help them. I didn't care how tough this lure person was. Those knights were killers. And there was only three of us. Four if you counted Uncle Press. What good could we do against an army? No, this was crazy. I made up my mind right there that the first chance I got, I'd get away from these nut buggers and get back to that flume thing. If it brought me here, then there may ha there had to be a way for it to get me back home. Yes, that was the answer. I was going to get myself out of here and kiss this place goodbye with or without Uncle Press.